We continue our lesson on 10 keys to spiritual growth. No second introduction. We're just going to start right in with number six, and that is fasting, which isn't something we talk about a lot, but it's a deliberate choice to focus in more intently on God. Fasting's been taught throughout the Bible in various ways for this, uh, I guess, famous example. Jesus was led up by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And, of course, a lot of folks went, yeah, but that was Jesus. That was Jesus. And if he was our role model, he's our example. And I'm going to tell you, you need to give some thought to practicing your fasting. Uh, it helps clean the heart. It helps clear the mind. There's a lot of things that can happen. It will help you refocus on what really matters in life. And I get, I know a lot of folks, especially in America, are like, well, you got to be kidding. No way. Oh, yes, absolutely. There's ways to do it. So in Joel 2 and verse 12, he said, Return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping and mourning. Fasting can be part of your turning back to God. It's a way to help draw nearer to God as you push aside all of these other things. And fasting is not just eliminating food, though that's what we think about. That's the part that scares us so much, isn't it? But it can also be the elimination of other things also, as 1 Corinthians chapter 7 would mention. We won't go there right now, but things just got really weird there, didn't they? There we go. So it's a way to draw near to God. It's also a tool for learning self-control. And this is uh, kind of interesting. If you've never fasted before, most of you have, usually you did it because the doctor said, don't eat anything after midnight or don't eat anything for 24 hours, depending on, on your test. And, and you find out you, you can do it. It's possible. And it's easy to do three, four-day fast. I wouldn't do those all the time, but it's something that you can do. So Paul would say, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And this is one of the things that we mess with is the we're being mastered by other stuff. I'm going to play with the buttons a second. And a lot of us are mastered by food. And diet controls everything. It's kind of funny. There are some folks, if they skip a meal, they think they've done something tremendously important. They think they've done something phenomenal. No, you haven't. From the American mind point of view, maybe so. But globally, there are people who count themselves very blessed if they get one meal a day. And that's all they get. And that's kind of sobering when you think about it. So... It helps us look at what actually has control of us. And not just food, but it could be Facebook, the TV, other recreational things. Fasting is going to help you conquer the flesh. And that's Galatians 5.17 where he says the flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. So fasting brings you back to God because he said you can't do anything without me. And so what happens in fasting is you grow your awareness on dependence of God. And we are totally dependent. We, we can't take our next breath without him. And so it will help enhance your spiritual clarity. And so you work it in. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not about to prescribe how and when you work it in. Not going there. I'm just going to say you do it. If you want to talk on a personal level later on, we'll kick some ideas around. But I don't think having a prescribed way of you have to do it this way is, is the answer. But we see in the New Testament there was fasting. Uh, this is one example, Acts 13, 2. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, so you have your prayer and fasting in combination there, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So fasting. It's about humbling yourself before God. We're not trying to show off or do any of that stuff. It's really about learning who we are and learning to discipline the flesh and bring it into subjection. So here's Matthew 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. 
Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who's in secret. Your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. So I want to encourage you, experiment with fasting. Look into it a little bit. Give it some thought. And uh, don't jump in too deep because it's going to totally just blow your mind if you jump in too deep. Just try skipping a meal. Just try to say, look, I, I don't need to eat lunch today. And look, most of us don't. And incidentally, there's a lot of health benefits in fasting. That's a whole other subject. What, what I'm talking about is not about losing weight. Because you can look at me and tell I'm a big old boy. Uh, and that's okay because I can fast one day a week and I can eat real good the other six days of the week, okay? So it's not like you're going to starve to death and dry up and, and the wind's going to blow you away. So, so check it out. And everybody's a little individual, so you got to be careful about it. Maybe some medical things you got to be aware of. Uh, you just you can't do a blanket statement. But it will bring about some spiritual growth as you begin to learn these things. And if once a year you did something really crazy like a five-day fast, it's really neat when you get to the last day and go, oh, I did it, and I didn't die. And then you realize how much more capable you are. That's kind of cool, too. Uh, it can reduce your dependency on earthly things, which is kind of neat because we are really entangled. can redirect your heart toward God, which I highly recommend. It can say, in essence, Lord, I want you more than. And then just start filling in the blank. It grows your strength, your confidence, your ability to move forward. And it does help develop your spiritual clarity. And so I'm going to move on to the next one, but I do want to say, don't just blow that one off and go, yeah, I ain't doing that. At least go to the internet and, and search it out. And, and if you don't want to do it for spiritual reasons, which I think ought to be your primary thing, then there's a list of, as long as your arm of physical benefits you get when you learn to control your diet and use fasting as one of those tools. It is one of the most amazing single things you can do, but you don't do anything. You, you get the benefits by not doing. It's just, I need to quit. That's one of my favorite topics. So now let's go to generosity. We're going to grow spiritually when we learn to be generous. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So imagine that you've gone out and you've tilled up 10 acres of land. You've got this beautiful thing and you've got it all rowed up and you've got you one little 99 pack of tomato seeds. That's probably not going to get you one row of tomatoes. And if that's all you plant, what are you going to get? Not a whole lot, are you? But I got 10 acres tilled up. Yeah, you do. And you've got to sow generously. You've got to put it out there with generosity. And so if you sow sparingly, you're not going to get much. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Now, I do have to say this because it is a fact. Every seed you plant will not grow. But a seed that you don't plant is guaranteed not to grow. So if you plant 100 seeds and 90 of them grow, I think you're doing pretty good. But what if you plant 1,000 seeds and 900 of them grow? Ooh, now we're doing really good, aren't we? But what if you planted 10,000 seeds and 9,000 of them grew? You see where we're going? You want to learn to get really, really generous with serving and helping and being there and, and sowing seed. And we're talking about way more than money. We're, we're, we're not begging money. I, I trust you make your contribution in an appropriate manner. What we're really looking at is time and talent and passion, being there for other people, and not just in the assembly, but in all of life, really being present uh, and seeing them and hearing them, uh, celebrating them or validating them, if you would. So you got to have this willing heart that just hungry to serve God. And if you're doing that and you start learning to give, it really becomes investing because in Matthew 6, 19, that's where he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. 
So give, learn to let it go. See, this is going to bring the flesh into control a little bit because the flesh always wants more, 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 and more. Thinking, oh no, if I don't get everything I want, I'm going to die. No, it's not. Flesh is going to do just fine. So we're going to choose God over stuff. That's the way to go. And it's going to help us set our mind on heaven. That's Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. It's going to help us present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. Now, again, I'm talking about your energy, your skill, your time, your availability. Just think about it a second. One person cannot be available to the entire congregation all the time. There's just not enough time on the calendar. It will not work that way. That's why it's so common for preachers to get burnt out is because a lot of preachers don't know how to go, look, I only got this much time and my plate's full. I ain't complaining my plate's full. I always wanted to eat, so I'm glad it's full. But I can't do everything for everyone all the time. That's just the reality of it. And then you add a couple more elders to the mix and a couple of deacons, and it's still too much. But if every member gives themselves wholeheartedly to building up, stirring up the congregation, and doing the things and making the con contributions they can, and again, I'm talking energy, skill, time, availability, just being there to listen. If we've got, well, let's say we've got about 80 people here this morning, and if we had 80 people who are willing to be available, it just changes the entire dynamic. 100%. So every good thing given and every perfect thing, perfect gift is coming down from the Father above. And so we get, we receive, and we give. Or in another place he said, freely you receive, freely give. Look around and go, okay, where can I give today? What contribution can I make today? And again, don't, don't build it up too high. Are you married? Then here's what I want you to do today. Husbands, somewhere today, recognize your wife. See her, hear her, and celebrate her. And I, I didn't have to be phenomenal, just something that's real and sincere. Women, flip it over the other way. I know you don't understand us men. We haven't figured ourselves out yet. But see him. Really see him. Hear him and celebrate him. It can be just the average mundane. It doesn't have to be phenomenal something or another. When was the last time you looked at your husband and said, I, if it works this way in your house, I, I'm so glad you take care of paying all the bills and I don't have to worry about the finances. Now, maybe that doesn't apply in your house. I don't know. But, you know, I, I just love the way you, you look out for me and you fix things around the house. Or the other way around. You know, I just love the way you take care of the house. I, I love the way you, that you listen to me. I, I love the way that we have fun going out together on a date, even though we've been married 40-something years. You get it? I'm not talking about big astronomical grand stuff. I'm talking about the daily living of life. Now, let's go to moral purity. you got to have moral purity if you're going to grow spiritually. Immorality, it's common, it's old as mankind. Anybody can do immorality. You're not doing anything special at all. So you're going to get in your heart, and you're going to learn to work your heart, because out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, fornication, thefts, adultery, so on and so forth. So our outside is really reflecting what's inside of us. Now you have to use caution here, but if you learn to read people, you can know a lot about what's going on. Now, you can't always know exactly specifically, but you can narrow it down to three or four options sometimes and go, I don't know which one it is, but they're dealing with something. And you pay a little closer attention, you might figure out exactly which one it is and be able to help them because we can't help but behave in a way that reflects what's inside of us. You can't stop it. Oh, you can fake it a little bit now and then, but what you do comes from inside you. And the person who knows how to look can see. 
The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. On the path of that, the straight and narrow, the path of morality, that's the path to take. It's the compass that's going to lead you a better way. Now, you might have to say no to a little money here and there. You may have to say no to this and that along the way. And you may have to stand alone now and then. That's okay. Because overall, the path of morality is going to lead you to a far, 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 far better place than the path of immorality. The path of immorality is always going to take you to a really ugly place. Now, it may be quite slow getting you to that ugly place, but it's always going to take you to a really dark, ugly place. You don't want to go. Don't, don't fall for that. So submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So this isn't a one-time act, but this is what we're going to keep doing. We're going to keep cleansing our hands. We're going to keep purifying our heart. We're going to keep working on ourselves. Always aiming to be holy as God is holy. We're going to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand. And in the end, that's what we want. To be able to get to the end of life and say with Paul, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. That's where we want to go. So, we get in there, we fight. Jesus understands the battle. He has been tempted like we are in all things. He was without sin. He knows what's going on. So we're going to get in here. We're going to set that good example. We're going to focus intently because it is the best way and it's going to make us stronger, which who wouldn't like to be a little bit stronger? And it's going to be a blessing. I think this last one's a little bit of a hurdle to get over. The world has almost brainwashed us that the shortcuts of immorality are the blessing. No, they're not. The shortcut broke the rules. Now, I like the speaker, and I can't remember who said it, but they said that's what Satan was trying to do to Christ in the wilderness in part. You see, Christ came to give his life a sacrifice for us and to die on the cross and to humble himself lower than anybody we could imagine so that God would exalt him and give him a name that is above every name. Okay, that, that's, and that's how it worked out, fortunately. Satan came along and said, now I'm doing a little paraphrasing here. I got a shortcut for you. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. It's yours. Shortcut. Jesus said, no, I'm not taking your shortcut. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And Jesus took the right way or the long way, if you would. He went through Calvary and he got everything Satan offered him and more. That's the path of morality. Then we have to learn to watch our words if we're going to grow spiritually because our words can heal and hurt. They can build up and tear down. I know we had that cute little rhyme when I was a kid, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie. That is a lie. That is a lie. Now, if you don't think it's a lie, let me know. And I'll get real snarky with you in person. And when I'm through with my words, you're not going to like me anymore. And then I'm going to go, no, it's just words. They can't hurt you. And you're going to go, but that was different. <laughs> yeah, you know, words hurt. There's no way around it. Words can break your heart and tear somebody down and really just tear the life out of someone. And where does all this start? It's back in the heart. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know somebody that just can't be friendly, they can't be nice, they're always whining, they're always complaining, they're always criticizing, they're always beating you down with their words? Something's wrong with their heart. If they had a good heart, it wouldn't come out that way, would it? If they had a healthy heart, it wouldn't come out that way. Hurting people hurt people. Now, when you get those people who don't know how to be kindly sociable, Something's wrong in their heart. I don't know what, but something is. So you have to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. My, wouldn't that help Facebook a whole lot? You want to learn to have that gentle answer that turns away wrath? 
A harsh answer stirs up work. Look, just learn not to escalate. It's tough. I was, I was talking to a police officer on oh, was that Tuesday night, and he was telling me about something that happened where he was working, and he says, I don't know why, but it just went all over me. It was a college kid, and they were using some language that didn't need to be used in a more family setting, and he just said, guys, y'all need to keep it down. This isn't a place for that. And the punk said something that just about making blue blow his top. He managed to hold it together. It, it, it turned out pretty much okay, but he, he had a little trouble with the gentle answer. It's tough sometimes, and I don't know what that is. We had a, a brief discussion, not three minutes. I said, I get it. I don't know why it is. Sometimes somebody can come up and say something pretty harsh to you and go, hmm, that's interesting. And somebody said, come up and say something similar, and all of a sudden you are livid, you are ready to fight, you are wanting to scream and blow out. I don't know why it happens that way. But I do know that if you're going to grow spiritually, you've got to learn the gentle answer. And you've got to learn to draw it back in and go, no, I'm not taking the bait. Because that's all that is, is Satan's bait. And that's what he wants you to do. Here, here's, here's the strategy. I'm the devil. I want Chris to sin. I see a co-worker of his that I know gets under his skin. And so I manipulate my chess game to get that co-worker in his face and get really under his skin. Because my strategy is, if I do this right, he will lose it. And we'll see the darkest, dark side of Chris Botterford. Kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, then that it happens and he explodes like Hulk. What happened to his Christian reputation? The reputation at work? Maybe his reputation at church? Who won that one? That's hard. But you do, this is what you do in the back of your mind. Now, I ain't taking the bait, Satan. You're going to have to do better than that. I'm not going to escalate. I'm not playing the game with you. you got to be deliberate, premeditated, intentional gentleness. Very intentional. Now, if you can learn to do that, you're way ahead of the crowd. You, you've, got, you've got some power there. Gossip's a big challenge for a lot of folks. Watch out for gossip. It's ugly. A perverse man spreads strife. If you're gossiping, I'm sorry. The Bible said you're perverse. I didn't say you're perverse. I agree with the Bible. I think you're perverse. But the judgment came from the Word of God that it said if you're spreading strife and slander, you're perverse. End of story. Argue with God about it. Gossip hurts people. And it hurts more than just the person they're talking about. Because here's my rule. If you will talk to me about somebody in a gossipy fashion, I know you have just proven to me that you will talk about me when I'm not around in a gossipy fashion also. So now when you gossip to me, you just didn't hurt the person you gossip to, but you just take my reputation of you way down to a whole lower level because I know how humanity works, and I think you know how it works too. Gossip feeds the dark side of the flesh. Don't do that. The old story is guy had two dogs in a fight and somebody said, which dog's going to win? And the old farmer said, the one you feed the most. Don't feed the dark side. You start feeding it, that's the dog that's going to win. So watch your words. Be honest with your words. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. We are so talented at equivocating and sidestepping and being evasive nowadays that we can lie without lying. Now, if you're not quite sure you understand that statement, just watch all the political ads today and tomorrow and Tuesday, right? Honesty is not a license to be mean or cruel. What we do is we speak the truth in love. So, don't go, well, i got to be honest. <laughs> yes, you have to be honest, but you have to be honest in love. And that's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? 
So we're going to encourage one another. We're going to build one another up. First Thessalonians 5.11 because words are just that important. You're going to let your speech be always with grace as though seasoned with salt so you know how you should respond. So that's a tool that works for or against us and we each make that choice. We really, really do. And then finally, I know Chris said I got an extra hour, and I really appreciate that, but somebody else told me once that preach, you can preach as long as you want. Now, I don't know if they'll stay on the pew for it, but you can preach as long as you want. I figured I wasn't going to find out how long you could endure the pew. So we'll get through this point and we'll be done. So you got to get your rest. If you're fatigued and you're weary, it weakens you. It really does. You know, a lot of us were getting old and cranky like me. I know we got an extra hour of sleep last night, but I'm like, man, you've up hit my circadian rhythm already. You know, now I got to be on my toes or I'm going to get cranky because I'm not getting to sleep when I want to sleep. Now I'll get adjusted and then they'll send it back. Rest is not just essential, it's a strategy. Sometimes you just need to go, no, not now. I need to rest. Uh, this, this isn't a good time for me. And in Genesis 2, 2, God rested the seventh day from all of his work. I think what he's doing here is setting us an example. I don't think infinite God really needed rest because he was fatigued. I think he's just setting us an example of saying, look, guys, y'all need to rest too. You need to work when it's time to work. And you need to stop working when it's time to stop working. And we're not infinite. So we definitely need to work some rest into our, our life. Jesus knows we needed it. Mark 6, 1, he said to his disciples, come away by yourself to a secluded place and rest for a while. For there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. Now let me do a little side thing there. When Jesus said, y'all need a break, it wasn't 10 o'clock after two hours of work. It was after they had so many people they couldn't even take a break to eat. Don't use this 10th point as an excuse to be lazy. We human beings can do a whole lot more than we want to give ourselves credit for sometimes. But rest is absolutely necessary. We're limited. I can't do everything. So I'm going to rest upon God. And he told me, you need to rest sometimes. That was part of the whole Sabbath thing. So here are 10 keys for both lessons. And you have to, if you weren't here this morning, you can get it off the uh, Facebook page. It'll be up there. Don't just check the boxes. Don't run through them and go, okay, I got that. And got that. Those are skills to grow. And you're going to take each one and out of the 10 there may be one or two you go, I really need to work on that. And then you just keep working. Forget what lies behind you. Press forward. Keep pressing on. And finally, Paul wrote, Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's where you want to get. You want to get to that always abounding. And I'm going to tell you one little last secret. If it feels to you like you're abounding, you're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to invigorate you. And yes, by the end of the day, you'll be tired, but it's so good to be tired when you go to bed and get a good night's sleep. Are you in the straight and narrow? Are you pursuing your spiritual growth? If you are, you know the answer. Stay the course. If you're not, it's time to change. If we can help you in a public way, let us know while we stand and sing.